I was recently on a mountain bike trip in Italy and while I was riding one day, I thought there are a lot of similarities between mountain biking and energy storage. How, you might ask? In this video, I'm going to show you how my body takes energy stored in food and converts it to mechanical energy, similar to how a fossil fuel power plant works. Then I'm going to show you how pedaling up a hill or using an electric motor on an e-bike to climb a hill stores energy through gravitational potential in a similar way to how hydroelectricity does. And then I'm going to talk about other emerging energy storage technologies and how they fit in. day in the life of a mountain biker. You eat a bunch of breakfast, you pedal and push your bike up a hill for a while, and then the fun part, you descend. And since this ride was in Italy, there were a few stops for pastries along the way. So how does this relate to energy storage? The breakfast eating part, energy is stored as chemical potential energy in the food. If it is a plant-based food or something that eats plants, then the energy originally came from the sun. When I eat, my digestion system creates some chemical reactions which release energy that I can use to move my legs and pedal my bike up a hill. Similarly, a coal mine or an oil or gas reservoir contains chemical potential energy that was created by plants who got their energy from the sun millions of years ago. And then instead of a digestive system, it's a power plant that will burn the fuel to create the chemical reactions that transform the energy to heat. The heat's used to create steam, which turns a turbine connected to a generator, which then converts it to electricity. Fossil fuels don't allow us to control the energy storage at all. It happened millions of years ago, and we can't create more fossil fuels if we have surplus energy in some other form. Plus, when we release it, stored energy, we also release greenhouse gases that would have stayed locked underground for millions more years. And now that we know that this is causing problems, we don't want to do that anymore. There are other ways to store chemical potential energy though, that we can control. The most common way is in batteries. We're all used to using batteries to store energy to power our devices. We've been using them for years and each development in battery technology has allowed whole new classes of technology to develop. They started with wet cells in the early 19th century to power electrical telegraphs, moved on to dry cells towards the end of the century, which allowed portable electrical devices to develop. Then came rechargeable batteries like lead acid, still used in cars. And most recently, the focus has been on new metals like lithium to reduce the weight of batteries. Lithium ion battery developments over the past couple of decades have seen uh, mobile phone sizes shrink and increase the range of battery electric cars. And now they're also starting to be used in the electricity grid like the Hornsdale battery in South Australia. And you may have noticed that batteries are also being used by cyclists these days. There are more and more e-bikes around. As batteries get lighter and cheaper, people are choosing to get the energy they need to get up a hill from electricity stored as chemical energy in a battery. And my method of eating food to get the energy to pedal up hills is starting to look a little bit old school. So batteries are one way we can store electricity to use later. It's a big topic and I'm going to be returning to it in future videos to look at specific applications. An alternative way to store surplus electricity in the form of chemical potential energy is hydrogen. If you use electricity to split water into pure hydrogen and oxygen in a process called electrolysis. You can get the energy stored in hydrogen back again, either by burning it, similar to how natural gas is burned, or via a fuel cell. In either case, hydrogen reacts with oxygen, which transforms the chemical potential energy to electricity, either directly in the case of a fuel cell or via heat and a turbine and a generator in the case of a natural gas style power plant. In either case, the byproduct is water. 
Now this sounds absolutely perfect having only water as a byproduct, but there are some downsides to hydrogen too and some challenges that need to be overcome. Again, that is a huge topic. Um, so I'll be exploring the opportunities and challenges associated with hydrogen applications in depth in an upcoming video series. So like I said, my energy storage method that I've chosen for this bike tour is starting to feel a little bit old fashioned. I'm eating food that I can essentially burn for energy just like a 19th century coal power plant did. As I pedal up the hill, I'm converting the energy again, this time to gravitational potential energy. And then on the descent, I convert it to kinetic energy as my altitude decreases and my speed increases. Now, at least this part of the energy transformation is starting to feel a bit more modern. Just like I'm doing here, pumped hydro gains gravitational potential energy as water is pumped uphill and then transforms it into kinetic energy when it descends. But of course, using gravity to store energy isn't new. Humans have been taking advantage of this for thousands of years, starting with water wheels turned by the flow of water running downhill through to hydroelectric dams located high in the mountains that controlled when to allow the water to flow downhill and turn a generator. But widespread pump storage is pretty new, or at least it's experiencing major growth right now. In pump storage, water is allowed to flow downhill to generate electricity at times when it's expensive or in short supply, and then it's pumped back uphill to the reservoir when electricity is cheap or oversupplied. Traditional hydroelectricity without pumping capability allows us only to store as much energy as falls as rain. If there's a drought, the water could run out, and where I'm from in Australia, this does happen pretty regularly. Pumped hydro allows a lot more control to balance out peaks as well as troughs in the electricity supply. But you can't put pumped hydro just anywhere. You need to have a suitable site for it, which means big elevation difference, and you probably want a water source. And hopefully you're going to stay away from damming beautiful and ecologically important valleys. So there are a lot of places on earth that need energy storage, but don't have a suitable site for pumped hydro. There are alternative ways to use gravity as storage, like hauling massive blocks up and generating electricity when they're allowed to fall again. There are several variations of this concept under development currently, including one company from very close to here who use cranes to stack concrete blocks into a tower, and then they generate electricity by lowering them again. I think the topic of energy storage is interesting because on the one hand, it's a very modern technology, but on the other hand, very ancient. We've really only needed it in a widespread way now that we're starting to add significant amounts of variable renewable energy to our electricity grid. And I think that that's why we've seen such a recent explosion in different kinds of energy storage technology development. But on the other hand, as I've shown here, the basic principles of energy storage and the different kinds of physics and chemistry that we can exploit to get energy when and how we need it, those are not modern at all. Nature has been storing the sun's energy as chemical potential energy in plants, animals and fossil fuels for millions of years. And humans have been exploiting gravitational potential energy as a means to create mechanical energy for thousands of years. But what is new is that we have gained the capability to take large amounts of excess electricity at times of oversupply and store it for future use. This is a crucial part of our green energy transition as it frees us from needing piles of coal or oil or gas reservoirs as the only means of energy storage. The better our energy storage options get, the more easily we'll be able to incorporate large amounts of variable renewable energy into our energy mix. Yeah, of course, I've only barely touched on the basics of energy storage in this video. It's a really important, but also really complex topic. And like, like everything that I talk about, like every kind of technology development, there are advantages and disadvantages for every type of energy storage. And as always, there are complex trade-offs to be made. 
and I'm going to be making more videos delving deeper into these topics in the future. So if you have a favorite emerging energy storage technology, tell me in the comments so I can make sure I cover it. And please remember to like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. In a future video, I'm going to be taking this bike ride example a little bit further and this time doing some calculations to uh, allow a comparison of some specific details. I'll be looking at the round trip efficiency and energy density of some different energy storage technologies. And I had the thought that since e-bikes are becoming so popular and hydrogen is becoming so popular, why haven't we seen a hydrogen fuel cell e-bike yet? So I thought it would be cool to do some preliminary design for a bike like that. So if that sounds interesting to you, then keep an eye out for that video in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.